Hello again, and welcome to Denton's Tales, and part two of The Longships. Or, or rather, I think I'll call this just Viking ships, since the, the longship wasn't the only type of vessel sailing the seas at that time. Now, previously in part one, we have seen how the term Viking, uh, used originally by the Old Norse to mean one who went somewhere and, and did something, was later used quite incorrectly to mean almost a nationality. You know, the, the Old Norse never called themselves Vikings in that ethnic sense, though they did refer to going uh, Viking, Fara i Viking. And we saw the emergence of the longship, the feared drakkar or dragon ship that became a symbol of terror during the 8th and 9th centuries. I mean, the, the mere sight of that distinctive sail on the horizon, growing rapidly larger as the uh, ships uh, approached, well, that was, that was enough to send the inhabitants of coastal towns and villages right across Europe, screaming for the hills. Good Lord, deliver us from the fury of the North, then, as the, the prayer was in those times. But, you know, that was not the only ship in use in Scandinavia. There were other ships that would, well, would actually have been a most welcome sight approaching harbours in Europe, and as far as Constantinople, the capital of the mighty Byzantine Empire. Cargo vessels bringing hard-to-obtain goods from the northern lands to sell or trade, and slaves as well, a very valuable commodity at that time. Now, the famous longships could and were uh, used for uh, trading uh, as well as more aggressive pursuits. I mean, if you wanted to trade and that was the ship you had, well, that was the ship you used. But in that case, the fearsome dragon or sea serpent heads were removed from the prow. Since, you know, while they were very useful to scare frightened people away and perhaps, you know, save having to fight them and thus make a raid easier, they would have been a bit of a hindrance when trading. You know, arriving in some merchant town looking as though they intended to kill something, get goods and leave without paying for them, well, you know, that would not have helped to establish a good trading relationship. No, not in the least. In fact, those heads were only fitted when the ship was engaged in raiding or in military operations of some kind. And in Iceland, it was actually forbidden by law to enter harbour with the dragon heads in place for fear of frightening or angering the landvatir, the guardian spirits of the land. And that, that applied elsewhere as well. So when you see in movies and, and TV shows such as, as, as Vikings, you know, harbours full of dragon-headed ships, rows of them all there with their, their dragon heads in place, that is incorrect. The heads would be fitted only after the vessel put to sea, and only if they were engaged in non-peaceful activities. Likewise, of course, the, the shields hung along the sides, intended to make the ships more frightening, but not really very useful as trading incentives. I mean, if you're coming in intending to trade or sell something, well, you hardly need one of these things. And if you have them displayed, well, it would indicate that maybe you were going to use them, and that would rather defeat your chances of doing very much trading or selling. Now, as I mentioned, not all Norse ships were those we think of as the long ships, the so-called dragon ships. And, um, of course, this is, this is an example of what most people's idea of a Viking ship would be. Long, narrow, pointed at both ends with the fearsome dragon head on the prow, probably representing the world ser uh, serpent of Norse mythology, Jormungandr, Shields hung along the side, with men, of course, rowing furiously, ready to leap ashore, brandishing axes. A ship fast and superbly suited for raiding, you know, able to come in quickly and, equally important, leave again even more quickly before any local resistance could be organised. But before, before we get to these almost legendary vessels designed for war and pillage, let us take a look at those other Norse vessels, ones that didn't scare the shit out of residents of coastal towns across the known world when they appeared on the horizon, and might actually have been, well, quite a welcoming sight if you were waiting for the goods that they had on board. At the bottom end of the scale was the fairing, a small open boat pointed at both ends, with two pairs of oars, 
Sometimes a small sail could be fitted. And a side-mounted steering board, uh, like a very wide oar, on the right-hand side if you, uh, of the ship facing, facing the front, from which we get the term starboard, in fact. The steering method used on all North ships. Also, like other North ships, the filing was clinker-built, uh, which was overlapping planks riveted together, constructed upwards, with each plank riveted to the top of the one below it, the, the clinker method. Now, the name of the boat comes from the Norwegian uh, um, words meaning four-oared. These small boats would have been used in and around harbours. They would have been doing things like, well, bringing people and goods out to ships lying uh, outside the harbour, either because they were too large to get into the harbour or all, all key spaces were taken. They would have been very common in, in most harbours, and they, they could have been used for fishing as well and, and other duties. And there were larger versions of them with four or six oars as well. Then there were the specialist heavy cargo vessels used for long sea voyages. Ships that relied on sails alone at sea, just having a, a couple of oars that they would have used for manoeuvring in harbour. The Knorr, for example. A vessel that came in various sizes, from a coastal trading version some 45 feet long and 11 feet wide, and would have had a loading capacity well, of around about 4.6 tonnes, the whole much wider, deeper and shorter than the uh, longship design, and requiring hmm, quite a small crew, perhaps five or six men, up to an ocean-going vessel some 54 feet in length and 15 feet in width, intended to carry much more cargo, uh, up to about 24 tonnes, with a, a larger crew and able to make about six knots under good conditions, which is about seven miles, miles per hour. They were used to transport people, animals, and general cargo over quite long distances. Wheat, fur, and pelts, armor, slaves, honey, and, and weapons. It would also have been used to supply food, drink, weapons, and armor to, to warriors and traders along their journeys across the Baltic, the Mediterranean, and other seas. Knorr's probably crossed the North Atlantic, carrying livestock, such as sheep and horses, and, and provisions and stores to Norse settlements in Iceland, Greenland, and briefly, probably, to Newfoundland and New Brunswick, or Vinland, as the latter was called, as well as trading goods to the British Isles, Ireland, continental Europe, and possibly the Middle East as well, and probably used considerably in the later extensive Norse colonizing that took part in many, many places across Europe. Another cargo vessel was the Birding, light freight carrying uh, ship, smaller and more maneuverable than the Knorrs, which were kind of bulky and probably a bit hard to control. Uh, these were some 40 feet long and 11 feet wide, relying more on oars as well as sails, and having maybe a dozen oarsmen, light enough to be pulled up onto a beach for unloading. Uh, these ships used for transporting merchants and their goods quickly from one place to another, and able to access towns that lay far up rivers due to their, their shallow uh, draft. Small ships like these would have been used for much of the long-distance river trade that was carried out by the Old Norse, such as when they travelled from the Baltic by various river systems down to the Black Sea and Constantinople, using rivers like the Volga and the Dnieper, where porting the ship over from one river to another was often required. You know, that was something that would have been a bit of a daunting task with a knorr, and uh, a fairly large crew would, would be uh, required, both, both to actually move the ship and to stand guard over it in case robbers might be waiting for just such an opportunity when the vessel would be at its most vulnerable, out of the water and thus unable to, to sail away. Um, only three Scandinavian harbours have so far been found to have had a pier or jetty or any other form of landing stage for ships to actually tie up to, and that's Birka, Kopang, and Hederby. The, the latter having wooden posts driven into the harbour where ships could presumably tie up and small boats like the Fairing would carry the goods to and fro. With, with other, other harbours seeming to have had stone causeways that, that went out uh, in, into the water, possibly for use at low tide, so that the wagons could be driven out actually to the ships. 
Given the low draft of most North ships, it's possible they were also run up towards the beach at high tide. As the tide went out, they would gently settle on the bottom, where they could then be easily loaded or unloaded, and then simply refloated when the next high tide came in, thus getting rid of any actual necessity to have a proper harbour as such. You could pretty much unload them anywhere where there was a tide. Now, to the long ships. The ships everybody thinks about when you say Viking ship, like our little friend here. Vessels intended primarily for war, for raiding, rather than transporting cargo. Fast and highly maneuverable, called a dracar, meaning dragon. That distinction being the animal head, typically a dragon or serpent on the bow. And sometimes a matching animal tail, so that a, a dracar could be any of the classes a Viking longship, a, a busser, a snekia, a skid, or, or, or a carve. Modern tests have established that these ships could reach speeds between 10 knots, or 11 miles per hour, and 15 knots, 17 miles per hour, depending on sea conditions, the wind, the number of rowers, if the oars were being used, and, and so on. One achieved a speed of 20 miles per hour and able to reverse, of course, almost instantly, if required, to get out of danger, since they were exactly the same at both ends, pointed at each end. So all the rowers had to do, basically, was get up, turn around, and row the opposite way, as if Yolaman Gander himself was right behind them. And incidentally, it's quite probable that the heads on the ships actually represented Yolaman Gander, the great world serpent of uh, Norse uh, mythology. In the longship, we see the culmination of decades of experience and design testing at sea that resulted in what was probably the finest ship design ever built for its intended purpose. In a word, well, in a word, it was perfect. They didn't come any better. Now, that's not to say that longships never ventured on purely peaceful trading or exploration voyages. They did. As I said, if, if that was a ship a man had and he wanted to go trading, well, then that's the ship, obviously, that he used, just without the fearsome dragon head on the front. While the cargo vessels, of course, they were completely useless for raiding. They were far too slow in their approach. And in any getaway afterwards, well, they would be dangerously vulnerable to any vessel that might try to pursue them and would probably be a great deal faster than they were. Longships varied in size, from quite small, fast raiders to huge vessels intended to overcome and impress with their sheer size, such as the 10th century king of Norway, Olaf Tryggvason's Ormerin or Lange, the, the Long Serpent, described by Snorri Sturluson in his uh, Heimskringla saga as exceptionally long, and its stem and stern were gilded. He wrote, The ship was long, broad, high-sided, and strongly timbered. The ship was a dracar, but this ship was far larger and more carefully put together in all her parts. The length of the keel that rested upon the grass was 75 ells. The long serpent had 34 benches for rowers. The head and the arched tail were both gilt, and the bulwarks were as high as in seagoing ships. This ship was the best and most costly ship ever made in Norway. In every half section were eight men, and each and all chosen men, and in the forehold were thirty men. Now, th this huge vessel had thirty-four pairs of oars, requiring sixty-eight men at a time to row it, and was said to be something around 140 feet long. Now, see, doubts were always expressed as to the accuracy of these tales of enormous ships. Was this simply saga exaggeration? Is that the size they would like them to have been? But were they, were they actually really that big, or have they been you know, exaggerated, shall we say? But during archaeological work along the banks of Roskilde Fjord in Denmark from 1996 to 1997, the wreck of a massive Viking ship was discovered, thought to date from the reign of Canute the Great measuring well over 120 feet in length, 13 feet longer than King Henry VIII's battleship, the Mary Rose, centuries later. That seemed to, well, it did prove that, no, these saga tales, they weren't exaggerated, they weren't boastfulness or wishful thinking, they really were that big, some of those ships. The long ship could strike quickly and be back at sea before any effective defence could be organised. And given its shallow draft, no town that lay on a river more than three feet deep 
was safe from them, no matter how far inland it might be. Demonstrated very clearly in France, where the Franks were absolutely astonished to find Viking ships a, a hundred miles or more upstream, on shallow rivers seen as completely unnavigable for any kind of sea-going ship. And, and here in Ireland, where Viking raiders penetrated deep inland, attacking towns that probably had considered themselves perfectly safe from any kind of seaborne raider. And then they would often branch out either on foot or on captured horses to raid the surrounding area. Though generally they preferred to raid directly from their ships, giving them a quick escape if required. They didn't want to have to ride back for miles to, to get back to the ships. In 837 AD, for example, 60 longships with 1,500 men sailed far up the rivers Liffey and Boyne. In 845 AD, they sailed up the river Shannon to Loch Ree, where a fort was established, having sacked the wealthy monastic settlement at Clonmacnoise, which got sacked rather frequently as it happened, with the raiders then going overland to Loch Lean, where they established another strong point before moving further north to Loch Ney. There must have been many towns that lay miles inland on shallow little rivers that would have basked in the knowledge of their safety from these evil pagans from the north. You know, I can imagine some Irish local chieftain scoffing at the very idea of a Viking raid. The Norsemen, is it? <laughs> ah, sure, no, don't be worrying yourselves about the, the, the Norse fellows that do be raiding and raping and devil knows what other kinds of unholy carrying on along the coast. Sure, sure, don't them fellas come in these, these big boat things like, you know? And aren't we 50 miles from the sea on a little bit of a river you could walk across and keep your arse dry? <laughs> uh, sure, it's hardly more than an elongated puddle, so it is. You couldn't get any kind of a ship up here. So don't be worrying yourselves, lads. We're all perfectly safe, so we are. <laughs> well, no, no, they weren't. The depth of a wet arse was about all a Viking longship required as many inland communities discovered to their cost. There is an interesting seagoing connection between the Viking ships of the 8th and 9th centuries and Ireland today, and that is the yawl, that's spelled Y-A-W-L, which is a small type of boat found on Achill Island off the coast of County Mayo. Now, these were originally pointed at both ends, as were the Viking ships, uh, Viking ships, and they were built in the distinctive Northern European clinker manner, with shipbuilding experts linking them directly to those ships from Scandinavia over a thousand years ago. The native Irish, having taken notice of the ships and their uh, technical uh, uh, excellence, and uh, as, of course, they did with other aspects of Norse culture, and they copied them. So there are ships sailing around that part of Ireland today which are pretty much the same as what them fellas from the north came in a thousand years ago. Now, there were differing kinds of drakars, as I said, and they were often classed by the number of oars they had or by their intended function. First, there was the carve or carvi, a longship design made of clinkered oak with a broad hull, more like a knorr, and anything up to 16 oars. Now, not not primarily a warship as such, being a sort of, well, a sort of all-round general-purpose ship which could be used both for warfare and for transport. It was a sort of dual-purpose vessel. Very useful for coasting, uh, uh, coastal uh, work, due to its uh, shallow draft, carrying livestock and people, but also a very useful vessel in time of war, though not a, not a particularly good seagoing vessel. It would be much more of a, a coastal craft. A typical a carve would be about 70 feet long and 17 feet wide. Then there was the snekia, or snake, less than 60 feet long and just over 8 feet wide. Now, very, very long and narrow, as the name, of course, would suggest, a, a snake. This is the, the smallest of the purpose-built warships, and it would be used for battle or for raiding, with up to 20 pairs of oars and a crew of 40 or so men. Though not the, not the largest uh, Viking ship, it would have been one of the most uh, common, much easier and, and cheaper to build than the larger ships, of course, which were, which were pretty expensive and took a long time to, to build, and still capable of carrying a large quantity of plunder, being very probably the most popular type of longship. 
The Danish version, intended for beaches and low-lying coastlines, having a very low draft, only two feet or so, while the Norwegian version, intended for the North Sea and, the, and even the Atlantic, it had a greater three-foot draft, as did the other, the other longships. And um, it was some 1,200 of this type of ship that uh, King Canute the Great was said to have brought to Norway in 1028 AD, which must have been quite an impressive sight approaching. These ships continued in service long after the so-called Viking Age, though they became larger and heavier than their ancestors, the, the Viking version being light enough to be easily beached or, or ported uh, if uh, necessary. A modern version of this boat, called a Snecki, is still in use in Norway today, its, its appearance very reminiscent of its uh, distant ancestor, another link with the, with the past. The Busse-class longship was probably the most prestigious Viking uh, warship, showing the, the high status of anyone who could afford one of them. They would have been quite expensive. Olaf Tryggvason's Long Serpent was one of this class. The Busse was the largest and most impressive Viking ship, anything up to 140 feet or more in length and having some 35 pairs of oars. These big ships could carry, of course, a very large cargo, making them very useful on large-scale raids, bringing back as much loot as possible. You know, you fill one of these things up with stuff and you have made a nice haul. And their great size and strength allowed the Vikings to travel much further uh, afield. The, the larger cargo holds making journeys across the oceans much easier than would be the case with smaller ships and, of course, more profitable. You could put as much stuff into one of those as you could maybe into two or three smaller uh, vessels. So you didn't have to take a, a fleet with you in order to get quite a good bit of plunder. Then there was the Skeed or Slider, a large warship almost as large as the Busse and considerably larger than the Snekia. The Skeed was a sizable ocean vessel, big enough to raid to the furthest lands or across the Atlantic. And one of these ships was discovered in 1962 during harbour development at Roskilde in Denmark. Made of oak and 98 feet long with 30 rowing benches and able to carry around 80 men. Now, very interestingly, analysis of the wood showed that it was a late era longship, circa 1042 AD, and it had been constructed here in Ireland, in Dublin or Dyflin as it was then, using timber from Glendalough in County Wicklow. A magnificent replica was made at the Roskilde Viking Museum and launched in 2004. And subsequently, in 2007, the ship made a momentous voyage from Denmark, through the huge Atlantic waves, around the north of Scotland, down the Irish Sea, past the old Norse stronghold of the Isle of Man, or Mona as it was called, and then to Dublin you know, the, the place of her ancestor's birth, making a, a very emotional entry to Dublin port, a sail billowing in the wind as hundreds and hundreds of people watched from both sides of the river Liffey, more than 960 years after the original ship had sailed in the opposite direction. She was named the Sea Stallion of Glendalough, very uh, appropriately, of course, and was lifted out of the water, and she remained on display at the National Museum of Ireland until 2008, before sailing back to Denmark the same way. During further work at uh, Roskilde Harbour in 1996-97, another similar ship was discovered, a massive vessel over 121 feet long, the longest Viking ship ever found, and dated to circa 1025 AD. Now, finally, there was the Cog, now, not a Viking ship as such, though the name Cog is recorded as far back as the 9th century, and so they were actually they were actually using them. But this type of seagoing ship seems to have originated along the coast of Frisia and was certainly well in use by the 13th century, being single-masted, clinker-built vessels with very, very steep sides and a flat bottom. Now, some Vikings had come from Frisia, which would explain the, the clinker construction, and these cogs began to replace the earlier Norse designs as cargo ships, able to carry greater loads than could the Knorrs. And their very high sides made them, well, much more difficult for raiders uh, to board, unlike the low freeboards of most of the earlier ships, uh, apart from the Knorrs, which probably made them much safer from pirates. It would have been far harder to climb up if somebody then was taking a whack at you with an axe or something from above. 
Their flat bottoms allowed them to settle on the bottom of a harbour at low tide, making loading and unloading considerably easier. Some cogs were used in, in a warship role, especially as military transports, with uh, crenellated towers fitted fore and aft for archers to, to shoot from. While not actually fighting ships as such, they owed their existence to them, inspired by what had gone before. Now, in part three, we shall take a further look at methods of shipbuilding, uh, Norse innovations, and other Viking ship-related topics, such as methods of navigation. How did they get from here to there? So, until then, I shall say farewell. Goodbye, until next time. Goodbye for now. <laughs>